Welcome to Succession Stories. I'm your host, Lori Barkman, founder of Small.Big. As an exit value planning and M&A advisor, I call myself a business transition Sherpa. My mission is guiding entrepreneurs on ways to build value in your business and then benefit by letting it go. On this show, we spotlight the theme of transitions, not only to reward you for your hard work, but also to ensure that you look back on your succession without regret. Catch all the episodes and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to visit SuccessionStories.com to sign up for our newsletter. Here's to your success. David Weibel is the CEO of Work Software and former CEO of Industry Weapon, a company he sold in 2020. David shares some of the mistakes and things he would like to have done better. One of the coolest parts of his story, I think, was his occasional investment of time over five years talking with potential buyers. Why did he do that? To learn how his business was going to be valued, and it paid off. They shifted one-time revenue into subscription revenue, which David coined as value creation revenue, or VCR, because it was aimed to increase their multiple. If you're thinking about selling your business, David shares some golden nuggets for what you need to take into account. Whether you're going to sell in five months or five years from now, listen in to figure out what you need to do today to get prepared. David Weibel, welcome to Succession Stories. This is going to be a pretty fun ride, I think, and talking to we you, <laughs> not only about your enthusiasm for entrepreneurship and how you help entrepreneurs, but your story about your succession and creating and selling your company. So welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah. And I, I hope we meet the hype. <laughs> Let's live up to that. Why don't we start with your entrepreneurial journey? How did you come up with your first company, which was the idea behind a company called Industry Weapon? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it really wasn't my first company, but it definitely was probably the one that I was with for the longest period of time. And interesting enough, the, the name came out of just probably a, way too many beers and the idea that we wanted to provide a solution to business where we were one of those things in their quiver that they pulled out when they were running into trouble that helped them win the game of business. Gotcha. So winning the game. And did you always know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Were you wired that way? You know what I was? I I had a father who was an entrepreneur. I loved every aspect of business. And I think I was very fortunate in the fact that I was able to see a lot of different areas in business through my father. So, you know, it was summers cutting grass to then working on the shop floor, rebuilding machinery to, you know, nosing around accounting and purchasing and sales. So yeah, I I always had the bug and I always, I always really enjoyed the passion and enthusiasm that came from entrepreneurs. And I think I, I just, I caught the bug. So tell me about industry weapon. What did the company do? So, you know, it was one of those really, really interesting opportunities. It helped non-technical people. So the marketing, merchandising, communication folks deploy their vision or their messaging on video walls, kiosks, and digital signs. And and keep in mind, this is 2007 when we really started our journey. And so uh, the big manufacturers were just starting to create devices at scale for for this type of thing. So we partnered and we're very lucky to partner with big companies like Cisco and Samsung and LG and all of those folks. But fundamentally our focus was to kind of demystify putting those messages on those devices. So I was in those shoes, right? I ran a marketing group and I recall learning about your company and I like how you positioned it, right? That it was technical for non-technical people. So you got to really understand who your customer was And how did you grow? What was the growth trajectory of the company from when you launched it to when you sold it? Yeah, so we weren't creative with the idea. We we had a really great elevator pitch, my two partners and I, in in how Industry Weapon was was put together in the first place. And we used to say that, you know, we helped create simple applications around complex technologies. And 
luckily for me, I was at an, an event and it had an opportunity where I bumped into somebody from Cisco and I was able to throw that elevator pitch at them. And they said, oh my gosh, you know, we just bought a company in this thing called digital signage. Would you be interested in, in taking a look? And that started our journey into signage. We were e-commerce guys, so drag and drop interfaces and things along those lines just came second nature. Integrating with data yeah, was was second nature to us. And so we knew we had something very unique for that industry. And then very similar to how we innocently bumped into Cisco, I, I just looked at how these guys went to market selling their hardware. And I found out that they used partners. And so... I just looked at all the partners that they had and picked up the phone and started calling and saying, hey, there's this new emerging technology. And if you need someone to help you sell your hardware, all we want to do is, is put this, this simple layer on top of it if the need arises. And that's, that's how we got started. We, just, we formed reseller relationships all over the world and then broaden our offering to go outside of Cisco to every other manufacturer. So we, we tried to be operating system agnostic, endpoint agnostic. So again, a marketing, a creative person doesn't really care about all of that stuff. They just want to know, how do I, how do I get this great message onto the screen? And so we tried to make it as, as seamless as possible for them to be able to do that without worrying about whether or not they chose Cisco or Samsung or whoever it may be. So the partner relationship was really important there in terms of your customer base. Were you also going direct to that end user or this primary sales channel was the way that the business grew? Well, without a doubt, the business grew through the, the reseller network and the channel. But it, just like every startup, the guy who's creating the platform or the idea needs to be close to the person who's going to consume it. And so... We never really had a strategy to go direct, but those initial sales really were direct until we we got our our legs underneath us. It was also, I think, an activity of de-risking the partners, right? They wanted to make sure that we could we could have a home with their customer that that would delighted them, and then they would just take it from there and 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 grow the business. And they absolutely did. So was the relationship with Cisco? exclusive for a period of time? Or was it always meant to be, you're going to work with Cisco and other companies? Naively, it was it was exclusive in my mind. It definitely wasn't exclusive in their minds. We never had any paper between us that said it was an exclusive relationship, but we were a small team. So we had all we could handle with just the crumbs that they would throw at us. Once we got our legs underneath us, we recognized that it, it needed to be a bigger solution because in that space in particular, no one manufacturer has devices that are going to meet the needs of those marketing people. Because, you know, as you know, being, being a creative yourself and having an agency, you have the vision. You don't want to be told that it's going to be hindered because of a hardware limitation. And so just out of necessity to serve the client, but also to preserve our well-being, we, we needed to go wide in regards to the, the partners we served. So I love talking about deals and transactions, especially for entrepreneurs like yourself that built something, grew it, and, and then had an exit, had a transition that was successful. So I want to jump ahead to that and use the sale as a way to look backwards at what helped drive the value of the business and why and how it became interesting to the buyer as a way for our listeners to understand what goes into not only building your business with an exit in mind, right, which I think is your story and that you and I had talked about off air as a way for people to understand that background, because it is not easy, right? This is a 10 plus year <laughs> type of thing. This was not okay. overnight, but I do want to talk about the sale. And again, then we'll kind of look backwards. So Tell me a little bit about the transaction, sharing what you can. I know there's a confidentiality of what you can and can't share, but just a sense of scope, like where was the business, who bought it, and, and so on. Yeah, so I should first tell you that the relationship with the potential buyers happened very early on. So it was about a half a decade before we decided to, to sell that I started having conversations with strategics, with growth equity, with private equity, with anybody and everybody who would talk to me, investment bankers, right? Just, just to get a good sense of what the industry looked like. And I got to tell you, that was so eye-opening for me in regards to how my business was going to be valued 
and what was a realistic expectation on on the sell price? I, I think a lot of times we're worried about even you know broaching that subject, but if we don't get clarity on it as the seller, you really hinder yourself in your ability to actually find the appropriate buyer. And so having all those conversations really opened my eyes. I was a software as a service probably before it was called software as a service. So I learned from from those bankers that I originally talked to that there was going to be really two ways for me to sell the business, a multiple of EBITDA, which would be awful, or a multiple of revenue, which would be amazing. And, and then it really became clear that, and I coined the phrase value creation revenue or VCR, it came from those conversations of realizing that some of the revenue streams that I had that were creating great cash flow and profit to the business weren't going to be calculated in in the sale of the business. And so that really helped me get my my house in order in regards to what revenue I wanted my team to focus on, what I wanted to focus on, and then most importantly, who the buyers were that I wanted to go um, go after. And so the conversations as I got closer and closer to to the exit time really started to to take shape and create some clarity for me. And then I also knew that, you know, we had taken a little bit of angel money. We all had some expectation of what the sale price was going to be. So it was really kind of simple for me to figure out at what point would everybody be happy with an exit? Not necessarily would we maybe be ready, but at what point and what did the business need to look like? And so there's, there's two things working against you in that regard. One is you need to make sure you're constantly having that upward momentum with the right revenue. But also, I think a piece that you realize that that time isn't on your side is the speed at which you get to that revenue growth is also going to be calculated by the buyer. So luckily for us, right around January 2020, I think all those factors had already lined up. We were already doing dividends. But for me, I just stopped having fun. I think everybody should understand what their values are. And for me, what gets me up in the morning, gets me excited about any business that I'm a part of is it needs to require me to be resilient, challenged, and it has to be fun. Just stop being fun. And so uh, I knew we were we already right from the metric standpoint. I was already okay from my investors. They were happy to pull the trigger at any time. They were just awesome in regards to allowing me to do whatever I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And we were very fortunate because I had those conversations for a half a decade. We got our LOIs that were very comparable, three in particular that were really great with three really great companies. Ultimately, we made the decision to go with the company that maybe wasn't as attractive from a cash and pocket standpoint, but we felt like would be the best for our employees. And that was really important to me too. I wanted to make sure we we picked the right company that could take it to the next level. I also wanted to step out. So it also told me that a strategic made more sense than than an investor because the investor probably wouldn't let me step out. So having all of those factors made a lot of sense. There's so many golden nuggets in what you just talked about. I want to <laughs> I want to underscore a couple of them. The first one being something I love talking about with clients and advising them is to really take the time to look forward. And if you are thinking about a transition for your business at some point in the future, which by the way, 100% of business owners are going to leave their company at some point in the future, right? Either voluntarily yeah. or involuntarily. So why not be proactive? You did that. As you said, you took about you know five years prior to get to know the industry and talking to strategics, talking to M and A firms or investment bankers, and just the really key point here is that the value of your company ultimately is in the eyes of the buyer, and that's what you did. You you understood what factors go into how they they look at that. That's sort of point number one. Point number two being how they were valuing your company was based on the type of company you were. So if someone's listening and they're like, oh, I want a multiple of revenue, not everybody's company is gonna be valued that way. So I think we should probably go back to, well, why was it valued that way? And it's because you were a 100% recurring revenue business, correct? Yeah, well, I should say 100% of how the valuation was going to get calculated was, was, on, that <laughs> was on that subscription, which interestingly enough, having that conversation a half a decade prior 
gave me the ability to look at some of the one-time revenue streams we had and convert them into subscriptions. And so, you know, that's the other nugget. You have all these really brilliant people who understand M&A that can be your Sherpa through this process, whether, whether through, you, you know, a, a service they provide or just advice that they give. And they're there to, to share it with you. And, and if, you, if you just keep your thinking cap on and your ears wide open, they give you the, the advice. And for us, it, it, we moved about 15% of our one-time professional services into a subscription, which benefited our customers, increased the amount of revenue that that stream actually was creating because it was more palatable to the customer. And ultimately, the revenue that was coming in now all of a sudden was playing a role in the exit price of the company, which again, we, we would have never known that if we didn't start having conversations with people who were experts at doing this. Well, that's a awesome commercial. And thank you for sharing that because there's a lot of people listening who probably are wondering how would they know these golden nuggets? And so you're sharing from your experience a variety of ways. And that's certainly what, what I love to do is helping people find these aha moments and learning about these little, I won't call it tricks of the trade, but it's sort of like, what's the playbook? And if you don't know what ocean you're swimming in, it's really hard to figure that out. So that led you to this concept of of VCR, as you say, which is this value creation revenue. And so that's how you were tying it together. You had this maybe one-time revenue or occasional reoccurring as opposed to recurring, right? And you couldn't necessarily count on it, but as a financial buyer is going to look at your revenues and profitability, they're looking at how sure are they, right, about the future flows of that that cash. So having a subscription model helps make that risk lower, right? It helps them understand that future value potential. Is that what you found? I did. You know, the other value that a VCR, value creation revenue metric has, is it gives you the ability to communicate that metric to whether whether people on your team are into finance and numbers or not, they can wrap their head around, you know, which revenue streams you find to be more valuable by coining it VCR. And and amazing things happen. You know, for us, we were primarily a technology software company. Um, My sales guys at times would would get um, frustrated because they didn't understand why I wasn't excited about the, the hardware sale they just made but I was super excited about a lower sale that was made in subscriptions. Well, once VCR took hold, they then got it. And then our our technologists started looking at the most important revenue and, and figuring out new ways to create features, functionality that either created stickiness, stickiness with the customer. So they didn't leave us right for that VCR and, and ways to reduce support tickets and enhance customers wanting to buy that VCR. And so it does so many different wonderful things for the business. And I think the biggest thing is it creates clarity across all departments in a company on on what we're really going for. How do we all row in the same direction, right? If if we all aren't financially minded, um, VCR really helps kind of distill it down so we all can get why we're going after the goal that we're going after. How did you message that? You talked about messaging it in different ways, whether it's to the technology team, to the sales team. Messaging is really important because you can't say it once and just think everybody has got it, right? How did you as a company instill those key concepts, whether it was on the metrics like a VCR metric or other things that the company key leaders and, and everybody on their teams, that they had that alignment? What, what did you find was really important there? Yeah, I, I can share a couple of things with you. One, one is I didn't do it as well as I wanted to do it at, at Industry Weapon, which is sort of why I'm doing some of the things that I'm doing now. Um, I did a daily recording out to all of my employees for, for 12 years straight. And I'll, I'll never forget because everybody always asks me, oh, how do you do it? What kind of technology do you use? And you know, how, how sophisticated is this? It literally, Lori, was every morning I'd wake up I would grab this thing called a, a cell phone. I would go to the recording uh, uh, app and I would say, good morning, everybody. This is, you know, whatever day, Monday, blah, blah, blah. 
I would I would say whatever was on my mind, and, and it was really important for me to tell them where we were going as a business, any roadblocks that we had in front of us, if there was an elephant in the room that needed to be addressed, um, and I would send it out um, to everybody via email, right? And it was it was attached. I'll never forget because uh, some of my colleagues would say, you know, not all the employees are listening to that. And, and I said, you know, at, at the end of the day, I really didn't care. Um, I, I wanted them to, but it also helped me doing things like this, trying to take a lot of the ahs and ahs out of my speech. Where I missed it is I feel like everybody had really great clarity on our VCR. They had really great clarity on where we were going as a business, but where I really fell down is I didn't distill my vision for the company to each of their career trajectories or, or where they were going as an employee in my organization. And, and unfortunately, that, that, that starts to you know, have the water cooler conversations that you're a terrible communicator or you know, so, something happens, they kind of, they miss the message because you haven't been able to show them how, what that means to them. And so, um, that that's that's probably one area I wish I would have done better at Industry Weapon, and and we're building tools to help leaders not make that mistake going forward at Work Software, which is one of the projects I'm working on now. That's a good learning. And as you think about the business and what helped drive the value of the company, certainly it was the recurring revenue model that we just talked about. But there's eight core drivers to what helps ultimately drive the value in the eyes of the acquirer. It could be things like culture. It can be things like how well organized your teams are, the processes, how well documented they are. It could be things like your sales process, that it was a flywheel, right? That it once it got in motion, that it became more and more productive. When you think about the valuation, and I know we can't share what it is, but certainly as a value, you know, a multiple of revenue, we, we know that. And it must have been a number that made you excited and then you felt good about. What were some of those other things that you can point to? Call it the structural capital, you know, the operations, the culture. Were there any other factors that the strategic buyer said, you know what, these are some of the reasons why we're giving you a premium above your peers that they really valued? Yeah, I think without a doubt, it's probably no different than when you find a great salesperson and you want to hold on to them. That great salesperson is someone you can build a budget around because, you know, the the outcome that they say they're going to hit is either met or it's exceeded. And I, my team at Industry Weapon was really good at that. You know, one of the one of the positives for having a company as long as we we had is we could point to, hey, we never had a down month, we never had a down quarter. Uh, here's positive cash flow. Here's profit. Uh, you could really predict our our. Um, growth and our success out as as far as you wanted to to go and and I know that was really important to our our acquirer that we were super super sticky with our customers so once you came into the organization you really didn't leave um, and they really wanted to understand that because you've seen it before with with different subscription based businesses they do a great job of selling but they did a terrible job of retention and. And I always say with with any company, don't don't show me first year success. Show me that the customer is is consistently buying years two, three, four, and beyond. And we had that in spades. And and they definitely wanted to understand it. We were global. We served a small customer. We had a bakery in Zanesville, Ohio, and then we were serving up you know global brands like you know like Under Armour. That that it just it was an interesting. Um, business that, again, was predictable, but at the same time had unbelievable potential. And I, I think ultimately that's that's what got their attention. That in, And again, they were on me that throughout those five years, that particular strategic was having consistent conversations and we were we just weren't ready, right? So we just kept pushing them off and and thankfully kept eating their lunch enough that they were like, hey, like let's let's really get serious here and talk about bringing you into the company. So I know you had advisors. You had a law firm, you had an accounting firm. You had advisors like that that you leaned on as you were thinking about going to market and preparing for sale. Um, as you reflect on your experience and selling the company, 
directly, right? That you didn't have an intermediary involved. What do you think are some of the biggest lessons learned and what would you do differently? Wow. Um, well, I can say first and foremost, I, I had the best team ever, right? So when it came to not having a banker, I didn't have to have an investment banker because I had two partners in my company that were awesome, right? That that gave me the room to be able to step out of the business and, and focus time without having the business go um, awry. So did it take David, a lot of time? 678 requests later. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It does. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it's not even just the, the amount of hours on the transactions. It's the amount of hours thinking about the transaction and, and all the stress that comes from, you know, every question, every request, do I have that document? Oh my gosh, is this going to happen? You know, we, I signed the LOI a week before the pandemic. And, and so immediately I'm thinking, I'm gonna get a haircut through this process. And thankfully we never did because, you know, we had, we had a great team in place to make sure the business wouldn't fall down. When it came to doing the deal, I had two rock star um, investors on my board that sold their company for a bajillion dollars, right? I had Eric Cooper and Mike Green, like, it's like, it's like you know, you have these unbelievable coaches that were more like coaches than investors to me that had already told me their stories of acquiring companies and, and what to do and what not to do. So that helped me get prepared. And then, you know, on the on the transaction side, I had Eric Klein, who was phenomenal, Mr. M&A and, and legal that, you know, was my psychiatrist as much as my lawyer. And then, you know, I had I had two amazing um accounting teams that were acting as my CFO, both, uh, you know, Mark Mooney and, and Jeff Koufax. So um, I, I had the DAC stacked for me because I had that team and, and that really, really helped. Now, where I, I would have done things a lot different is I knew the superpowers of our team and, and they were incredible. I wish we would have done a better job at documenting and highlighting each employee's superpower because unfortunately the buyer was much bigger and they didn't have quite the view into some of these amazing people that I did and they made some dumb decisions in my in my opinion um, because they weren't able to see what what we already knew and so I, again that that's one of the things that I'm working on with our new one of our new projects at work software is to make certain that those awesome employees that sometimes are a little more passive from a personality standpoint, don't fall through the cracks and, and don't either leave the organization or let go from the organization because someone doesn't see it. So that's a good segue. Let's talk about what's come next because you are an entrepreneur through and through. You jumped into your next project, as you call it, which is uh, work software. And that's how we got connected because yep. I think Eric made the connection for us in terms of what I do and working with companies to help them create value and transition when they're ready to their next venture or to sell, whether it's buying a company, selling a company. And for you going through your experience and now with work.software, it just was a really good fit. And so our, our firms are partnered and I'm excited to be able to offer this service and product to my clients because for all the reasons we're going to talk about, like how does this platform help a company scale effectively and do the things that you talked about where if you had the ability to jump back in time, you would have, you know, you would have done some of those things. So let's jump into that. What's the mission of the business? Well, the mission of the, the business is to improve employee performance and, and help consistent growth into a company. And, and, and you know, dealing with companies, it, you hit plateaus at, at certain levels where, it, you know, whether it's companies fall off at this certain revenue level or, or they just kind of uh, taper off. You know, it's, it's getting to a million, it's getting to 5 million, then 10, then 25, and then beyond. And, and so what I found interesting with our organization is we started to use a methodology that I ended up coining the action-based framework. And, and it was utilizing the ability to see the things that were going on into the organization and, and making changes in the organization prior to the next monthly financials coming out. So I said, you know, we were always cash flow positive, profitable, and debt free. And it was because 
we can make these changes. And so at Work Software, we, we formalized the action-based framework, and then we started to put tools in place for some of the things that we wished we would have done better at, at Industry Weapon to allow leaders to be able to you know, grow their business, take that vision, and if they're at that, that, that breaking point, be able to bust through it and take it up to the next level. So there's really just three components, and it's really simple, you know, and, and it kind of fits with this conversation. The first is you need to understand how to play the game of business. And so there's a very specific way you keep score, just like in football, it's field goals and touchdowns and safeties, right? In business, it's cash flow, profit, revenue, and then eventually, of course, I'm not going to forget our VCR or value creation revenue. And so we look at that quarterly. We use it as a, a way to gauge whether or not we're winning at the game of business or not. So we always want to see those numbers increasing. The next and probably the juiciest part of this is, is all around accountability. And, and it's the piece that I am most passionate about because I feel like I could have done a much better job. Accountability, meaning the inter or the interaction or collision between the manager and the employee not dismissing the annual um, evaluation that needs to happen where the employee and the manager fight over pay, but actually tabling that and, and utilizing a very simple process to every month create some clarity and get some frequency between the manager and the employee talking. And so we serve up a thing called a map. So we want to know, hey, how do you rate the employee's mindset, ability, performance, and how does the employee rate themselves in that regard? And that's doing nothing more, Lori, than, than having a deeper conversation with the employees so that you don't fly by the desk of the good performer and say, Lori, keep it up, good job. And so once that's done and we kind of go over the delta between both our surveys, we then create what we call an individual impact plan. And this is the piece that I'm probably most proud of. It's, it's allowing the employee to understand what is the one metric that they're going to be measured by um, and when they prioritize their day, they should put this at the top of their list. What are the actions that they can take to make that metric um, you know, a success for them at the end of the month? This gives the manager a chance to be a coach. So if the manager got promoted and isn't, a, isn't really sure what to be a manager or how to be a manager, this helps them get into that coaching of showing them how to actually make a better, uh, better month than the month prior. Then the last piece, and always uh, stresses everybody out is that plan has to be relevant to the business. It has to tie back to one of the goals, right? So just like in every sport, every position needs to actually contribute to whether we're winning or we're losing in the game. And so this is really important to make sure that that metric is helping us all win. The last piece is what I call a strategy. And that is, hey, now we know how to keep score. Now we know the teammates and their strengths. What's the playbook in each department? How do we make sure that when things change that we can change on a regular basis? And so work software helps create collaboration in a more streamlined way every week between the department leader and his or her managers. Because we all know manager thinks it needs to be done this way, employees doing it this way, but somewhere in between is probably the right way. And so we leverage a collaboration strategy and a uh, application that walks you through weekly meetings so they're not a snooze fest. They're really helping employees be able to perform independently the next week, give the manager time back to manage, and then hopefully see the department consistently growing up and to the right. Um, and then on top of it all, work has a, a intensity score that it gives to the employee the department and then the overall company, allowing companies to be able to say when they're not maybe performing exactly where they have an issue so they can prescribe the right solution. And I think that's the that's the really neat thing about this system is I've seen a ton of different um, management consulting technologies out there, but usually they're an integration in another report to just say you suck. They don't actually show you where you need to work this thing does it and and it does it in a very very innocent and and easy way for you to actually correct and it, it again it all comes down to just doing the work right like you, it it's all about grinding it out and and not just from the bottom up but from the top down as well i think what's really cool about the framework is a lot of companies are 
pretty decent, let's say it's setting strategy. There's a lot that are not. I have a lot of clients that have no strategic plan or they've thrown it out the window because of COVID and they're sort of hitting the reset button. So, so I'm a big believer in having a plan, right? Because if you have no plan, then certainly you're not going to know where you're mm -hmm. headed and you're not going to get there. So if you have your plan, how do you gain that alignment? How do you go from, hey, here's this lofty vision and here's this lofty mission and our objectives and our goals to actually executing? And there's some statistics out there that basically say 80% of the companies are not effective in implementing their strategies. So we fall down in the execution. That's a problem. Your system takes it to that level to say, hey, here's the cascading, right? Here's the cascading that needs to happen. And that was a big, that was my philosophy too when I was a CEO and running a business was, yeah, we set the direction with the strat plan, but then we actually brought these things to life, operationalize them and try to get them to the level you are. Could we have used your tool back then? Yeah, probably <laughs> to help with that. But I think that was one of the things that really I found compelling about it. And I think as companies are looking to create enterprise value, it's about the sustainability of the tools and the systems, right? To help deliver the value to the client and then therefore getting that, that return and ROI on that effort. So congratulations to you on, on that transition because going from selling your company to then figuring out what's your next thing and kind of this mountain climber mentality. And I know you yeah. like to run and climb mountains and <laughs> that sort of that analogy works. It just clicks when I think about you that you've jumped into your next thing, which is super cool. And again, I'm excited about our, our partnership there. As you think about then, as we wind, start to wind down this conversation, some actionable things for business owners to think about, whether it's from the reflection from your experience on building and selling your company, or if it's pertaining to how to be effective in implementing these goals and the mindset and getting the alignment, what are some of the takeaways you'd like to share? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I think that question, although it, it sounds like it's going to require multiple um, answers, to me, really only uh, requires one. And, and, and that is that start having the conversations now um, and, and more often. I always say that simplicity isn't about dumbing things down. It, it's really just about two things and, and doing these two things on a, on a regular basis. And, and that is um, frequently do them, right? So have conversations with your employees or strategics or, or strategists um, frequently and then clarity. Ask the questions to get clarity on what it is that you're either going for or that you're not able to accomplish. And, and at the end of the day, that that is what drives everything forward. I, I, I found, you know, especially with employees, a lot of times we think, you know, oh, they must just be lazy or they're just not going to do it. Well, sometimes it's just that we either A, talk too fast or B, we haven't said it enough. Like, you know, everybody is the, my, the, my dreaded four letter word, busy. Um, and so sometimes they don't hear you. So you, you, you've got to say the thing that you think only you need to say once, many, many, many times, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 times. And so frequency is, is key. And then making sure that you have on your team, whether it's the advisors or the employees, um, a team that's not afraid to ask those clarifying questions like, I don't quite understand that, or let me repeat it back to you so that I think I heard what you said. Um, it's amazing to me how just doing that simple act um, will move the ball tremendously forward. We just, I think, so often think, you know, because we know it, everybody else knows it. And I can tell you, the clients that I work with and the clients that pass at times on not wanting to work with work software, it's all because it's that accountability and the and the grind it is to actually communicate more regularly that that either you know turns them off or turns them on to to the success. And unfortunately, you know, or fortunately, depending on your personality, that that's what's required to to move the the business forward or get to an exit is you got to talk to a lot of people and, and get clarity on what you're hearing and saying. Yeah, that's a good point. So do you have a favorite saying? I know you have, I know you do, I know you do about lots of things, but is there something that that helps uh, give you a guiding light? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the, the quote is from Mike Tyson, which is, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And I think it, it is it is 100% been one of the things that has driven me my whole life. I, I think, you know, early on, I had a lot of successes. And then the way I started Industry Weapon is I got fired from a job and, um, you know, and had nowhere to go, I had two kids, had a mortgage, had all of that stuff and didn't know what to do next. It was the best thing that ever happened to me because I realized that I could get punched in the face, fall on the floor and stand up on my own two feet and, and, and march forward. And, and I think every day we have certain versions of that that happen to us. Um, you know, it doesn't mean we, we, we stop planning, but it's, it's really good to know that, you know, you can, you can grind it out when you need to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that quote has come up before. So you're not alone that it's resonated. And I think a lot of us have experienced that shock to the system or something you just didn't expect. And thematically, it is something that's why the show is around. That's, uh, we talk about the theme of change and transition, and sometimes it's planned and sometimes it's not. And I love how you describe that. And, and that's how you, you know, led you down the path for your entrepreneurial success. You know, one of the things that you and I are doing is continuing to educate business owners on how to create value, whether it's to have that successful sale in the future or just to run a more effective business and they could put their feet up on the desk and and have other things to do besides the day-to-day -day aspects of running the business. And so we've got a webinar that we're doing around that topic of value creation. And I know from the time of we're recording this, you know, I just want to mention that because I'll be sure to include a link to it in the show notes. And so I'm excited to be able to continue the conversation with you in a, in a, in a more granular way for, for our listeners. I agree. And you know what I love about it too, Lori, is because we have the skill sets that we have, it's like there's there's tactical things that I think every leader needs to, to know, do, and understand. But then there's these strategic things, these these softer things that that end up coming up, right? And I think one of the one of the fun ones for me is understanding your values, right? Not not the fluffy ones, not the be the great 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 dad, parent, whatever. But what is it that actually drives you? And I, I think for every leader, it's so important to understand when when it's time to exit a business. Sometimes it's because oh my gosh, it's so the the offer is so good, I can't pass it up. But sometimes it's just I'm ready to write the next chapter, and I need to understand why I'm ready to to write the next chapter. Right? What is what is missing that isn't making me feel great? And that's what's awesome about this next series is you get the tools on how to, to tactically go about it. And then you have all of the strategies on the big why, right? Everyone says, come up with the big why, but they, they don't tell you how to figure out the big why. It's That's hard to right. figure out. It really <laughs> it is. is. And you, you can't just sort of sit down and write it in 30 seconds. Maybe you can, but then you put it away and you come back to it and, you know, you race and type over it and it is really, really important. And so whether it's for you personally or for the business or that intersection, I agree. I think the exercise to really understand your values is so important. You go to a company even as big as Amazon, and I don't know if you've ever been to an Amazon distribution yeah. center. I, I have. And you go into the, one of their conference rooms or you go to headquarters and you look up and on the walls of the conference room are there 20 values, like 20. I mean, they have a lot and they explain them <laughs> and they repeat them as you were saying about messaging earlier. And so knowing who you are, knowing why that's important, that helps give you that North star and set that direction. And so, yeah, making tough decisions based on your values, that's kind of what life's all about, right? It is. Yeah. So if people want to connect with you or find you online, David, what's a great way to do that? Yeah, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. So, you know, obviously uh, you can find me just by typing in David Weibel. It's W-I-B-L-E. And then uh, my my email address is david at work.software. So not dot com, but dot software. And that's, you know, that's the best place. They also obviously know you, so they can reach out to you and you can you can connect them that way too. So there's there's a variety of ways. Absolutely. Well, this was really eye-opening. You're an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. You're passionate about what you do. Thanks. You bring a lot of value to companies that are looking to transition over time and be more successful. So thank you for being on the show and sharing what you've learned. 
Thank you. It was a blast. My objective is for you to have a lucrative and successful succession. If you want to understand the value of your company today, the potential net proceeds of a transaction, and your financial needs after you leave the business, that's a great place to start. The sooner you understand these numbers, the more time you'll have to close the gap if there is one. Take the next step by requesting an initial meeting to begin planning for your business transition and strategic exit today. Request a call with me by visiting smalldotbig.com. That's smalldotbig.com. I look forward to speaking with you.